Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. What are the policies that we can implement today that are going to really change where we end up? Things that really matter compared to the spin machine we hear. It was just such a moving experience to see uh, hundreds and hundreds of people coming to help. Rustin Strong and still standing after a deadly tornado in April. I'm on bonus time. I really feel that way and I live that way. A victory over cancer and living a full life. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a look at other news making headlines across Louisiana. The State Department of Transportation and the Five Parish Bridge Authority hope to take a big step by the end of the year with a proposed new Capital Region Mississippi River Bridge. The goal is to have a consulting team in place for the pre-construction planning necessary for the project. The process is filled with government guidelines, which must be met to remain eligible for federal funding as it moves along. The steps may seem tedious, but without them, the project would fall apart. Senator John Kennedy's office is hosting three service academy days this month for students with an interest in learning more about the U.S. service academies. The events will take place in Monroe, Lafayette, and New Orleans. West Point, the Naval Academy, Air Force, Merchant Marines, Coast Guard, and local ROTC programs will be on hand. The program gives students a chance to ask about free college tuitions and other perks, and the event is free. The state's only four-time governor reportedly had an issue with his blood sugar level, which is why Edwin Edwards was sent to a Baton Rouge hospital Wednesday. Doctors say dehydration could have triggered it. One of the state's all-time best-known politicians, Edwards was tried and convicted in 2000 on bribery-related charges and jailed for almost a decade. He was released from jail in 2011 and has lived in Baton Rouge ever since. The lifelong Democrat is 92 years old. Louisiana's Little League heroes continue to live like kings. The crew of Bacchus says the world champs from the East Bank and the East Bank Girls World Series finalists will ride in the Bacchus Parade February 23rd. A unique float for the teams is also apparently in the works. Since returning from their World Series win, it's been one engagement after another for the kids. The University of Louisiana system has an app, and its goal is to get Louisianians back in school so they can earn their college degree. System President Jim Henderson beamed about the program and the app. It's all about re-engaging about 650,000 people around the state with some college credits who dropped out before they finished. Also, Baton Rouge law enforcement leaders announcing a new initiative aimed at decreasing gun violence and encouraging gun owners to lock up their weapons. They're releasing four public service videos with testimonies from several people who have witnessed gun violence in Baton Rouge, including parents who've lost children to homicide. My name is Reggie Morgan. I've been affected by violence so many different ways. I've been on both ends of the gun. I went to prison for attempted murder. Also, I've been shot four times. And I could honestly say that my life was affected, not just mine, but my family, my kids. So many times we think that we have to react to situations when you really don't. When small situations come, I just let it slide. It's not worth it. Because of my history, what I've been through, and I know I'm coming from the heart with it. Um, I think that let it slide will give them an option to not just have to react to so many different things. Today's about gun safety and gun violence and our combined message to encourage one and prevent the other. There are no political messages or positions taken, just our desire to encourage gun owners 
to properly secure the weapons in our homes, to keep them out of the reach of children, to prevent accidental discharges, to properly secure uh, weapons uh, after leaving home in unlocked vehicles so that they can, those will not be stolen and used in crimes of violence, and to send the message that gun violence is not the way to resolve conflicts that exist. It is our pleasure to be involved in this project, but when Hiller Moore calls you and says, I really need your help, and then Polly follows up and says, I think broadcasters should be doing something together to help uh, stop some of the violence that's going on in this community. We were very happy to assist in this fashion, and I'm so fortunate that we have a great team of uh, Christina Melton, D. Ray Washington, who have edited um, these uh, various spots. It's very interesting that we generally don't cover crime news, if you will. That's not a public broadcasting particular area. But we certainly see the impact on the children when we do ready to learn and education outreach activities. We've been doing this for 37 years, and in 37 years, no one has did identity has ever been known. We, the people in Crime Stoppers Office, we don't even know who these people are, these concerned citizens that contact us, because we never ask their name, we never exchange names. We do not want to know who you are, but we do want to know the information that you have. Our role in the mayor's office is to complement what is going on uh, with the commercials that you see or the public service announcements that you see. And so we are going to encourage responsible gun ownership because we understand that it is critical to our community. So this Saturday morning at 8.30 at the Baton Rouge Police Headquarters, we're going to kick off our gun safety initiative and we call it Project child safe. The four public service announcements will air in the coming weeks on local television and radio stations asking residents to use gun locks and help law enforcement arrest those breaking the law and to help put an end to gun violence. Conservative death penalty opponents gathered in New Orleans on Friday for two days to discuss the best way to convince political allies in Louisiana and other right-leaning states that capital punishment should be abolished. The organization Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty, which has been lobbying against capital punishment for several years, billed the event their first national meeting. With 25 participants and two dozen states involved, the meetings take place in a state where lawmakers overwhelmingly defeated the latest attempt in May to abolish executions. As we move closer to the October 12th fall elections, we are hearing now what you'd expect in campaigns. Take the governor's race, for example. When you hear a TV spot for Governor Edwards, you get the sense that all is right with the state's economy. There's job growth. But to hear it from his GOP challengers, Representative Ralph Abraham or business tycoon Eddie Rispone, the state's economy is slumping, in trouble. It seemed like it was time to call in the experts on this. So two of the state's lead economists, Dr. Jim Richardson from LSU, Dr. Stephen Barnes from the Blanco Public Policy Research Center here to talk about this um, thing that we hear and uh, it's, it's common to campaigns, but um, are they telling us the truth? What are they telling us? What are they not telling us? Jim? Well, I think first they're using, the numbers are right. The problem is their interpretation of the numbers. And that is, if you listen to uh, uh, the, the Republican side, they say, we have lose, we've lost jobs. Well, we have, but what we're doing is we started losing jobs before, President, uh, uh, before uh, Governor Edwards took office because of the oil and gas problems. We continue to lose jobs to about 2017, and then it started picking up. Not incredibly fast, but it's picking up. So when the governor says we are doing better, we are doing better. I'm not sure we're the strongest we've, we've ever been, right. but we are doing better. <laughs> now, um, from their side, we don't have as many jobs as we did at the, a, a, in 2015, but we were losing jobs before he took office. So it's a matter of how you play the numbers. And I think in the sense, our problem is we are still a very much an oil and gas state. Mm -hmm. Oil prices dumped from a hundred over $100 per barrel to $30 per barrel. That shut down a lot of industries in the state and we lost, we've lost 20,000 people in the oil and gas industry. That is something that it doesn't matter who is governor, if it's Governor Jindal, Governor Edwards, doesn't matter. It happened, there's nothing they could do about it. All right, Steve, your take on this. Mm -hmm. Generally, the point Jim was just making there about you know how some of these broader economic factors will influence the state, 
Um, I think it's important to recognize that we're competing in an increasingly competitive global economy. Um, and when we look at how Louisiana has fared, uh, you know, there's some bright spots that we can point to, but losing people uh, is, is kind of an expected outcome when you see very, very low national unemployment. Right. People are able to be competitive to find jobs elsewhere, paying more. Um, so I think more than anything, this is a time for us to stop and reassess the real question, which is not just how much have we moved from some point several years ago, but where might we have been under different policies? And much more importantly, what are the policies that we can implement today that are going to really change where we end up five, ten years from now? Yeah, what can affect change? State uh, legislative economist Greg Albrecht researched the candidates, what they're saying and how they're saying. So we've heard what they're saying. And, and why don't you tell us, uh, for example, the state's economy? What is the, um, the nonpartisan uh, description of our economy? Well, when we look at the economic data, um, one of the most commonly cited statistics is gross domestic product. You know, that's sort of a measure of all of the economic activity happening in the state. And when you look at gross domestic product on its surface, in, in current dollar terms or in, in nominal terms, it has been going up and up and up, and we're at, you know, a historically high level today. I think the real element is we've had this issue for a long time and that is we need to diversify we have not really diversified under any administration for the past 20 years and that is something where if we don't do that we are going to stay keep falling behind other states because you look at texas texas is an oil and gas state they have a lot more than just yeah, oil and they, gas they certainly we do. have oil and gas and that includes the petrochemical industry but and we have tourism but once you get past that, not that there's not much. very much else all right guys thanks so much for uh telling us the, uh, the real story on this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you now. Now those two Republican challengers to Democrat Edwards Thursday, they grabbed more headlines when they started drawing distinctions between their campaigns with differing opinions on how to achieve the tax and spending cuts that they both say they want. Representative Abraham says if he's elected, he'd immediately call a special session to rewrite state tax laws and address infrastructure needs. Eddie Rispone came back with his plan, saying he would overhaul the state constitution, including provisions on taxes, spending, state employee protections, and education. And hey, a reminder, the Louisiana governor's debate is fast approaching. You can watch it live from the campus of UL Lafayette. That's on Thursday, this, uh, September 26th at 7 p.m. This debate will broadcast live across the state on LPB, and we will stream it live also. It's co-sponsored by LPB and Council for a Better Louisiana. The city of Ruston, Louisiana is still recovering from that deadly tornado that struck the college town in the early morning hours of April 25th. Damage is now in the millions and the center of a major recovery effort for the city and Louisiana Tech University with leaders on both sides vowing to come back even better than before. The city of Ruston took a direct hit, the EF3 tornado packing winds of over 130 miles per hour. Ruston Mayor Ronnie Walker says that powerful, punishing storm striking exactly at 147 that late April morning. The things that stand out the most to me about that tornado first was, uh, doesn't matter what you train for, what you plan for, you don't plan for those exact kind of events. Uh, it was devastating to me because I felt so helpless even though we were getting things done. Homes and businesses that have stood for decades left in a pile of rubble. A mother and her son killed when a tree crashed into their home, but almost immediately a bright spot. About 7.30 that night I finally got into one area that I had not been into and this lady's house was just, her yard was just perfect. And I said, how in the world did you get your yard cleaned up? And she said, oh, I had 30 college students from Tech come and help me. And I went, where in the world did you find 30 college students? Who did you call? She said, they showed up. I went, how did they know to show up? She said, they told me they were following the sounds of the chainsaws. A call for supplies through social media also leading to an overwhelming response. We did that on Friday. People started bringing stuff in. And on Sunday, we had to send out a notice saying, Hey, we got too much stuff. Don't bring anything else. And other volunteers by the dozens stepping up too. We asked for volunteers on Friday, 
on Sunday we were able to say, hey folks, instead of coming to the Civic Center to pick up supplies, all you have to do is call our phone number. We will have someone deliver it to your house because we had that many volunteers. And help through the homegrown charity among neighbors continuing. This city showed what it's always been, and that's a city of faith, a city of community, and a city that wants to help and do their own, what they can do for their, their neighbors and all, and that showed out. Walker says now, though, some of the big task, after big successes like getting 80% of the town's power back on in four days and restoring five miles of fiber technology. So we got a lot of things done quick to kind of get things back to somewhat of normal. Schools were able to open, roads were open, things like that. But then it becomes the, the marathon part, getting the debris removed. And of course, we had so many trees down, so much large debris. Uh, we aren't equipped to handle that stuff. We had to get a, a contract with a national company. Now it's a matter of people trying to work through um, their insurance and decide what they're going to do. And he says they're going even further to help those trying to get back on track without the means to do so. We've set up some long-term uh, assistance, not through the city, but the city's kind of taking the lead to where if somebody did not have insurance or were underinsured, we're having some carpenters come in, we're having some uh, supplies donated. Uh, we made a decision as, as a city the day that it, that it happened not to charge for any building permits. And Louisiana Tech's efforts to repair, restore, and replace are underway too. My house is actually on this campus and so I could actually hear the trees snapping and as the tornado passed through our campus and knew that it was going to be quite severe. Very severe, the baseball, softball and other sports fields still showing very visible reminders of the damage left behind that also hit other buildings, vehicles and power lines. We're really blessed now. We uh, have gone through several weeks of preparation, doing disaster assessment, and now we are preparing uh, to d begin demolition of some of our major facilities on the campus. President Les Geis of Louisiana Tech says just after the storm hit, he went out to see for himself exactly what happened. It was really devastating. The streets were unpassable in many cases. Utility line, power lines were down and uh, it was quite concerning. And, and um, we saw the impacts of our campus, which were mostly on our athletics facilities and, and our residential facilities and intramurals here on our campus. But as he continued to survey the damage, he says it became clear much work lay ahead for a large part of the Ruston community. But as we started driving around the community and saw the devastation to the homes and businesses that were places where our faculty and staff and students lived, it really struck us of the significance of this tornado. President Geis says he can't say enough about the 1,500 students who came together in even larger numbers for a planned community event to help the Saturday after the tornado. They were carrying these big heavy logs and, and debris and working together to try to bring our campus back uh, to a state of function uh, so that we could actually get back to classes on the following Monday. So for now, many projects are in the works while others will take a while to complete and a new academic year is underway. Now as students and faculty begin to arrive on campus, they'll see the progress. Uh, I met with our faculty yesterday and I, I told them, you're going to see a lot of contractors, a lot of activity all across campus for the next few weeks and months as we go through this restoration. Back at City Hall, the mayor of Ruston says budgeting to make things right after the tornado was challenging, but... Even though it's tough from a budget standpoint right now, we cut our budget a little over $2 million because I mean, you take uh, $5 million cash out of your reserves, you've got to do something. But we were able to do that and still give our employees a raise, but we did that without cutting a single employee and without cutting a single uh, customer service. He says he believes in the end, Ruston Strong will be much more than a slogan on a t-shirt. Yes, Ruston is very strong. That was showed more than anything else in those two days. Damage estimates right now from that April tornado are said to be more than $9 million.
In 2002, three years before Katrina, the legislature had had enough with skyrocketing cancer mortality rates, their deadly toll on families, and financial impact on our economy. So they directed the start of the Louisiana Cancer Research Center in New Orleans. We visit there and also the Tulane Cancer Center, where one survivor long ago stopped counting the days he had left. Hey, I'm preaching about How you. How are you? <laughs> good to see you, man. I'm doing good. Good, good. I we am, like that. Yes, sir. I'm doing good. These are yeah, great like days for Clark Gordon of Ocean good. Springs, Mississippi. Brought, brought but just a few years ago, great was hard to find, and hope was slipping with a disease that had ravaged his family and was now targeting him. My dad was first with colon cancer, and then my mother followed that some years later with multiple malignant cancers. His own cancer experience included a colon cancer diagnosis and successful surgery in 2003. His health returned. The cancer was gone. It felt like he had won a victory over the scare of his life. You know, you get complacent, you know, it's gone and you don't go back to the doctor anymore. But in late 2015, his body began to hurt. Experiencing some lower abdominal pain is, and it gets worse. We did a biopsy and it was ugly. It was stage four prostate. I knew I was facing a, a tough road. So he asked around, wanting to find the best doctor available. The name he was given overwhelmingly was that of Dr. Oliver Sarter, medical director of the Tulane Cancer Center. An internationally recognized expert in prostate cancer, he conducted a genetic test to discover why chemotherapy was not keeping Gordon's stage four cancer at bay. He had already been on the best hormones and failed, already been on chemotherapy and failed, and was facing a very bleak future. And all of a sudden, we had another option. Using this genetic information, that other option was immunotherapy. Dr. Sarter's therapy adjustment delivered the medical answer that changed the outcome for Gordon. An amazing experience. I get very emotional about Dr. Sarter. <laughs> this is a man who was probably given six to nine months to live. I'm on bonus time. I really feel that way, and I live that way. Just blocks from that two-lane facility is this state-of-the-art Louisiana Cancer Research Center, or LCRC. Tulane and LSU, the state's top academic research centers, were original partners. Xavier University and Oxner Health System later joined, and their alliance goes after cancer research grants with the goal of one day becoming an NCI-designated cancer research center. Research centers with such a designation receive the bulk of federal cancer research dollars and offer cutting-edge clinical trials and treatment options for patients. Dr. Augusto Ochoa is director of the LSU Cancer Center in New Orleans and co-director of the LCRC. Because this region has one of the highest incidences and mortality for, from cancer in the United States. And because cancer is such a complex disease that it's rare that any single institution has all the knowledge, the capacity, and the whereabouts to provide appropriate cancer prevention, early detection, care, and long-term follow-up for all patients. In 2018, LCRC partners were awarded more than $23 million in cancer-related grants, a total of more than $355 million since they opened their doors. By building partnerships with community organizations, with community hospitals, and with other academic centers. Ochoa says the creation of a Gulf South clinical trials network, which provides a statewide base of cancer care, is an example of bringing together the best and the brightest we can offer um, access to cutting-edge clinical treatments in a whole variety of diseases throughout the state. This program, when it first started 20 years ago, we had one site, Charity Hospital. Today, with the combining of all of these organizations, we're going to have 42 sites throughout the region. Dr. John Cole heads up clinical cancer research for Oxner Medical Center and is co-director of the LCRC. He says the network allows those in Louisiana living with cancer to feel connected. The LCRC and, and with the partners in the LCRC and especially the uh, Gulf South Cancer Research Network, uh, really that's an opportunity where patients can actually access the website, they can look for clinical trials that are ongoing in the network, and they can also uh, access the uh, individual partners websites 
uh, to look for trials that might not be part of the collaborative effort. The biggest thing that's happened over the course of the last decade or so has been our understanding of what drives cancer. So what happens at the gene level? How do those genes go bad uh, in a way that either permits cancer to develop or drives the development of cancer? So the understanding of genomics has really driven a lot of our therapies. And then the other big uh, chapter in terms of new therapies has been the immunotherapy uh, really revolution that's occurred over the last few years. And for the last 13 months, Clark is treatment free and in remission. I'm still working on a bucket list, but, I'm add, but I add to it. That's the fun part. Good to see him. Now, who has hit the hardest with cancer? Minorities, but a group of LCRC partners collaborated with others to win a $13.6 million grant just this week to expand clinical trials with a special emphasis on the minority and the underserved. And Xavier is leading studies on population and looking into health disparities. Sounds incredible. Really some good stuff going on there. Well, everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our brand new app. Download it for free from your app store. Its upgraded versions features news, public affairs, documentaries, how-tos, and many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.